international ENT live stream. Uh, and then for this special situation, uh, we invite Professor David Ken. Uh, thank you so much, David, for, for accepting our invitation. Uh, before you start your lecture, I'd like to thank you so much uh, for the Brazilian Society of ENT, Brazilian Academy of Rhinology to support our meetings, our moderator, Dr. Shirley Pignatari, and, and the panelists uh, present here uh, for accept our invitation. Uh, after that, I'd like to call Professor Shirley Pignatari, who is the moderator of this section. Please, Shirley. Oh, thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, hoping that everybody is well in good health. Um, as Aldo said, David Kennedy does not need any introduction. Uh, he's so respected <coughs> and so well known worldwide, uh, has many friends uh, all over the world, especially in Brazil. And uh, I would like uh, to call attention for our friends. Uh, we have a, a, other four distinguished doctors, very young doctors, uh, but very thoughtful. Uh, to enrich our discussion. So uh, wave your hand, uh, Carlos Diogenes from Albany, United States. Hello. <laughs> Otavio Pilcher <coughs> from the University of Rio Grande do Sul. Uh, Fabrizio Romano, are you there? Wave your hand. Fabrizio Romano is from the uh, Un um, University of Sao Paulo. Uh, he's current the president of the Brazilian Academy of Phrenology. And Luciano Gregorio, he used to be my fellow from the University of Federal University of Sao Paulo. <laughs> so, David, if you want to fix your uh, first slide, it's going to be fine. And if you want to say something, that's fine too. No, I've got to try to see how to share my screen. I'm not seeing it pop up here. Let me see. Here uh, the okay. bottom line, you see a sharing of uh, your screen or something like All that. All right, we're getting there. Just give me a minute yeah. to get this organized. And uh, uh, let me go back one. And so, you know, I want to say it's a, it's a pleasure uh, to be here, even if it's only virtually. And um, I empathize with, uh, with the COVID issues that you have down there and the same issues that we have here. Um, we have actually reopened our operating rooms in our clinic. Um, and uh, we were sort of working half, half of our schedule up until today, up until yesterday. Um, and uh, today we've we opened up fully. So um, I'm in my OR garb because I'm just out of the OR and just got home because I had a little trouble uh, getting home. So um, what I'm going to do is just talk a little bit about the early introduction of FAS. I want to talk about how the techniques have, have sort of uh, evolved. Um, discuss some of the major changes which have occurred in, in the management of CRS and tell you a little bit about what I've learned over 35 years now of, of doing this. 35 years, wow. Um, and, um, and, and review um, how the, the, the evolution has continued in terms of, of CRS management. Um, and then finally, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on, on what's hit us now, which is the new COVID era and how that impacts on rhinology. So um, let's start by, um, by going back a little bit and I, I'm talking about what I have learned. So one of the things is, you know, it is a continually humbling experience. Um, and, and part of the reason for that is because it's difficult to manage a disease which is not really a disease, it's a syndrome, um, and it's a whole lot of disorders that we really don't fully understand. So second thing I would say is what we learned in our residency, and this is true for any residents listening in today, um, is not going to be a lifetime of truth. And we're entering, I think, a, a new and somewhat difficult time uh, within the field of rhinology. So let's go back to the 1970s 
long time ago when I was a resident and and what it was like back then. And it was very different because we would do plain film x-rays and they showed you the frontal sinus, they showed you the maxillary sinus. But you couldn't tell anything about the ethmoid sinuses from that. Um, and so we focused our surgery on the maxillary and the frontal sinuses. Um, we were taught to strip irreversibly diseased mucosa. And if you, if you didn't do it right, um, then uh, if you failed, it was because you really hadn't stripped all of the mucosa from the area. And we should expect significant morbidity. Um, things changed a bit for me because um, I worked with, with a guy called Don Proctor, who's one of our professors at, at Hopkins. And he was an unusual individual who really studied mucociliary clearance and airway clearance in a big way. And I got to do my resident research uh, time with him. Um, he, was, uh, he was actually the first chair of the Department of Anesthesiology at, at Hopkins because Blaylock, the big cardiac surgeon, didn't want anyone who was going to fight with him. He didn't want anyone who was uh, going to be a I think a really well-trained anesthesiologist. So um, uh, he appointed Don Proctor. Um, but Don was really best known for his work in environmental health and on mucus early clearance. And as I say, I got to work with him as a resident. And I think that was helpful because um, later um, I got invited to go to a, a meeting in Dubrovnik. And I, I got invited to go because I was doing, I was doing otology, neurotology at that point in time. I was doing the lateral skull base stuff. So the neurosurgeons would call me to do the transphenoidals just because it was, um, uh, it was convenient for them. And so I published our transphenoidal experience and got asked to present it um, in, uh, in Dubrovnik. And that's where I first met uh, Messerklinger. And, and I realized um, while I was there that he was starting to do surgery and it was exciting. And as soon as I came back, I wrote to Carl Stortz in the US and I said, as I mentioned, I'm convinced that endoscopic sinus surgery will probably revolutionize surgical approaches in the future. So early on, we thought that if you had something like a concha bullosa, and all you had to do was to take off the contrabullosa and open up the maxillary sinus and all the inflammation would settle down. That was the initial idea. We thought it was primarily or, or more often than not anatomic. What we sort of forgot, I think, was that if you open this area up, now the airflow hits all of these areas and if you don't control the underlying environmental factors that cause this in the first place, then you're actually going to start the inflammation at a deeper level. And we didn't think perhaps enough about the general host factors um, and the underlying genetic factors that predispose towards chronic sinusitis uh, at that point in time. In actual fact, um, we did recognize, and this is a slide from our original, our first course in 1985, um, to show that we actually even then did recognize that the OMC was sort of the final common pathway with a lot of different factors acting on it. And it really wasn't the underlying cause of the disease. And I think that's an important thing to remember. And I put in a picture of... Uh, my good friend, Heinz Stamberger, um, the late Heinz, uh, just to show um, how he looked back uh, in 1985. Um, that was actually during his first course, uh, which followed us um, uh, later in the year. Um, so we miss Heinz uh, a lot. So, Let's think about how we used to think about the disease and how we think about it now. So previously we thought that it was primarily infectious problem, that antibiotics were sort of the mainstay of therapy 
We had this idea that we could restore the sinuses to the sterile state and that mucus recurrence and ventilation was really the underlying problem. And, and when the complex was opened, everything would settle down, as I mentioned. Now I think we recognize that it's really an inflammatory rather than an infectious disorder. It's multifactorial. It has a much greater impact on quality of life than we previously recognized. And it requires long-term management. It's not just a surgical problem. And finally, we now know that it has a very major effect on the lower airway. And it's very important to control the sinuses if we don't want to develop problems in the lower airway um, and, and have worsening asthma and, and bronchiectasis. The other thing, of course, we've realized is that the sinuses are not sterile. Um, and in fact, the microbi microbiome is broader in health than it is in disease. We've learned that a lot of the time, culture does not show us the predominant organism, um, more than 50% of the time, and that previous uh, unsuspected bacteria uh, are implicated in the pathogenesis of chronic rhinosinusitis. So we've started to get some sort of handle on the bacteriology. But then the other question is, what about the fungal microbiome? What's the role of the fungal microbiome in sinus health or sinus disease? And I don't think we really know that at this point in time. It's a great area for future research. Why does 100% of the population have the fungus that causes dandruff in the nose? Is it helpful? Is it a problem? We really uh, still need to go ahead and explore the fungal microbiome very significantly and get a better understanding, I think, about the bacterial microbiome. So where are we now in our understanding? Well, we know that it's not a disease, but rather it's a syndrome with a similar sort of constellation of symptoms. It's much more inflammatory than it is infectious. It remains poorly understood as we've said, the quality of life has been dramatically underestimated, and we need to improve our classification of the different diseases which are included under this concept of uh, chronic rhinosinusitis. Finally, it's very important to realize that CRS may be symptomatic or it may be asymptomatic. And, and that's something actually the American Academy of Otolaryngology didn't recognize um, back in 2015. They said rhinosinusitis is defined as symptomatic inflammation of the paranasal sinuses and nasal cavity. And all of us know that that's not true. There are um, both symptomatic and asymptomatic chronic rhinosinusitis. And it can be either. And just because it's asymptomatic doesn't mean that it doesn't need to be treated. It probably doesn't need surgery unless it's a mucosal, and mucoseals can be asymptomatic, um, but it does need to be treated. So why would you need to treat asymptomatic disease? Well, one example would be a mucoseal, another would be a silent sinus syndrome, another would be polyposis um, uh, when it's affecting the lower airway or polyposis and cystic fibrosis. There are a whole lot of asymptomatic um, uh, disease that we may need to manage. Uh, so it's important to recognize that it can be symptomatic or asymptomatic. So when we see a patient with CRS, um, we have to sort of decide whether that's the cause of the patient's symptoms or whether the symptoms are really unrelated to it. And then once we decide that, we need to try to think in our mind, what are the important factors in that particular patient? So sometimes it could be environmental, sometimes it could be general host factors, and sometimes it could be local host factors.
And then we also need to think, is the patient really complying with medical therapy? So these are some of the environmental factors, some of the general host factors, and some of the local host factors that we have to think about um, in addition to uh, dealing with, uh, with patient compliance. So one of the questions that always comes up is what is appropriate or maximal medical therapy? And the answer is, it really depends on what type of sinusitis you have. Um, if it's eosinophilic disease, and in the Western countries, um, eosinophilic disease is present about 80% of the time in patients with nasal polyps. That's not true in the developing countries, it's not true in China, uh, but it certainly is true in the Western countries. And they re typically respond extremely well to steroids. Uh, we know that staph exotoxins are a factor in this. Um, allergy and environmental uh, issues probably should be evaluated as part of what really constitutes maximal medical therapy. And we may want to think about monoclonal antibodies if, if it's a very unusual or difficult to manage disease. On the other hand, neutrophilic disease um, has a greater role for antibiotics. Um, it is uh, uh, maybe helped with topical antibiotics. Steroids, although effective in neutrophilic disease, are probably less important. And, um, but uh, uh, long-term antibiotics might be a consideration. If we wanna go further, then we really need to classify the disease by cytokine analysis. And that really becomes particularly helpful when we start thinking about the use of monoclonal antibodies for difficult to treat disease, because that helps us then to select the best monoclonal antibody if we need to do that. So the patients that I see typically have had prior surgeries, they tend to be difficult to treat disease. And so what additional evaluations do I do when I see these patients with difficult to manage disease? Well, these are some of the things um, that I need to think about. I need to think about the possibility of a granulomatous disorder, uh, autoimmune problems, obviously aspirin sensitivity, um, environmental factors, particularly with mold, um, which, is, uh, which you can react to even if you're not allergic to it. Um, and then uh, in, our, in the US, we have to think about cystic fibrosis. Uh, so these are some of the things that we uh, think about in those difficult to, to manage uh, chronic rhinosinusitis patients. So back in the 1980s, we did a lot of this surgery under local anesthesia with headphone music. We don't do that anymore now. Why don't we do it? because we've realized how much more meticulous you have to be um, to, to really make sure you preserve the mucosa on the medial orbital wall and on the skull base, and we want to get all those bony partitions out. And so we use general anesthesia with TIVA, and, um, and we can either use topical epinephrine or we can use injections um, to make sure that we have a dry field. I want to just take a minute to talk about image guidance um, because to me the biggest role for image guidance is doing what I'm doing in the video here which is scrolling through the pictures while the patient's going off to sleep and making sure that I've really conceptualized the anatomy that I can really um, understand where that frontal sinus drainage pathway is going to be, where the cells are going to be. And, you know, to me, image guidance during the surgery is, I think, not uh, that important. And actually, even with the newest devices, barely accurate enough to be, uh, to be of great benefit um, during the surgery. But that conceptualization is just key.
when we actually start the surgery, the landmark, the landmark is the medial orbital wall. And that's what we need to skeletonize and identify and use as our guide throughout the surgery. And we do it by feeling behind the bony partitions and slowly skeletonizing until we get to that uh, medial orbital wall. And then we can identify the skull base and then we can skeletonize the skull, the skull base. But it really always, the key is feeling behind the bony partitions and slowly skeletonizing it and using that as, as your landmark. Now, sometimes obviously the bone is too thick to use through cutting forceps. And what I do then is I use a Blakesley forceps just to fracture the bone and then take the disease out uh, with the micro, uh, micro debrida and make sure that I preserve the bone over the medial um, uh, orbital wall and skull base. So, we used to be taught that you pressed on the eye to see when you're on the orbit. Uh, that day has gone. Um, and what we now do is what I've termed the lamina push test. In other words, once we get down to the area of the lamina, you push with the forceps and you start to see it move as a unit. Why is that more important than pressing on the eye? Because by the time you, you actually see something when you press on the eye, you've usually got periorbiter or even fat exposed and it's too late. But by doing the lamina push test, by getting down there to the medial orbital wall and then pushing with a forceps, you see it move as a unit and you immediately know exactly where you are. Um, and that's what I'm trying to demonstrate in a few of these cases here. Uh, you see some residual bone. These are all revision cases where the bone was osteotic and thickened. That's why I'm actually fracturing the bone with the Blakesley forceps as I get down to the medial orbit. And then what you'll see is that I will push on it and it will move as a unit so that we know. Now here I'm pushing on the globe and you can see nothing is happening. It's not moving at all. And, and yet when I push with the forceps, you can see it move as a unit and I know that I'm on the medial orbital wall. So that medial orbital wall is our key landmark um, during the ethmoid dissection. I won't bother showing another one, we'll just go on ahead. So next thing is finding the sphenoid and, um, and if I'm gonna just show, here we are in the last posterior ethmoid uh, on the right side and the optic nerve would Debbie, você está sem som. Your microphone. Can you hear me now? Yeah, okay. All right, I, was, I just got muted there for a little bit. So uh, here we are in the last posterior ethmoid cell, optic nerve would be over here. And the key to finding the sphenoid sinus is to palpate the superior meatus, as I think everyone is aware, um, and preferably with a ball tip seeker. And then we go ahead uh, and take off the inferior portion, the superior turbinate, and that leads us right back to the sphenoid sinus, sorry, in an uncomplicated case. And then we go ahead and open it. Of course, it's not always quite that easy. Um, here's a case where the sphenoid was a little bit more difficult. Um, this is a patient who had uh, had pituitary tumor resection. Um, he'd had a, a second resection. Um, and following the second resection, he lost all of his vision in the uh, right eye and 50% of his vision in the left eye. Um, and then he had a third resection by uh, Ed Laws up in Boston. Um, and he was referred to us at Penn following uh, multiple episodes of meningitis. And here are the films just to see it. You can see where the bone is eroded uh, back in the area of the cella by the macroadenoma. But we also see what looks like hydroxyapatite uh, in place. Um, we can see that there is residual tumor, but in actual fact, given the degree of visual loss, our neurosurgeons did not want to surgically tackle um, the, uh, uh, the recurrent or the persistent uh, tumor. Uh, 
uh, since it was pretty well decompressed. So let's look at what we saw at the time of surgery. And here you can see the hydroxyapatite posteriorly. Um, you can see there the anterior wall of the sphenoid we on the hydroxyapatite. We're just going to get ourselves a bit of room here, taking off some residual uncinate. Um, and then we fully expected that what we would find with three episodes of, uh, of meningitis was the CSF leak. And that's why I'm using the yellow filter here. We put in fluorescein. Um, we're expecting to find a leak. But as we continue going, um, what we find is just lots of hydroxyapatite, uh, which we have to drill away. And I'm drilling it away here as we go on back. And we could not find any evidence of a leak. Um, so we looked multiple times at the blue light. And then I find this area um, back in the sphenoid and I'm putting a needle in just to make sure what it is, although I believe it's a, a mucosal. And in actual fact, we did see some mucus when we did it. Um, so now we're going to open this area up. And what you see is obviously a mucosal um, posterior to the hydroxyapatite um, under the cellar. And we're going to go ahead and just drill that bone and open it widely. And then I'm going to incise and fold back the mucosa because I want to try to make sure that this area stays open postoperatively. Uh, in actual fact, I followed this patient for a, uh, a few years post-surgery, um, and the patient has not had any further episodes of meningitis. So it was from the mucosal. Uh, there was not any, um, any actual leak present. I'm just taking away a bit more of the osteotic bone there uh, to make sure the thing is widely patent um, and, stays, uh, and stays open postoperatively. So um, once we've opened the sphenoid sinus, we want to work forwards along the skull base. And this just shows the typical anatomy in a cadaver specimen, the posterior ethmoidal neurovascular bundle in the skull base here, uh, the anterior ethmoidal neurovascular bundle uh, right below the skull base here. And then this is probably the most common anatomic variation. You see a supraorbital cell here, a supraorbital cell here, then the frontal sinus is right in front. Now, this is not the only variation, of course. The anterior ethmoidal could be up here, um, but it's the most common variation. The thing to remember is how thin the skull base is in this area here. We're about somewhere between 6 and 15% of the time uh, it is uh, membranous. So um, we work forwards, um, and then we'll open up the frontal recess. We want to have a dry field to do that. I want to say a word about the maxillary sinus, just because we used to think that was the easiest part of the surgery. It was the part we gave to the most junior resident. Um, and now we know that it's just critically important to make sure that the anterior portion is really open, and that this, is, uh, uh, this goes all the way forwards here. Um, and, and so we want to end up with a sort of pear-shaped antrostomy and make sure we get all that uncinate off because that uncinate where it fuses into the medial wall of the maxillary sinus tends to thicken up. And to be really sure that it's all open, it's good to use a 45 degree telescope. So let's just take a look at a video on just a polyposis patient. It's a patient with no prior surgery. Um, the, um, there's nothing special here except that the skull base is, is low posteriorly, as you can see in these films. Um, sphenoid has a fairly small um, vertical diameter. I like to do a transoral injection, and that's what I was doing there of the sphenopartine, just if I'm going to go posteriorly. Um, and uh, so, you know, obviously the key here is to get the polyps out. I had to take some polyps out before I could do an injection anteriorly. Um, 
We're just gonna go ahead and take the polyps out before we open the ethmoidal bulla. And this is one of these cases where the bone was thickened, so I'm gonna have to use the Blakesley forceps to crush the bone. Uh, I couldn't through cut it. And then you can take the, uh, uh, the, the bony fragments out um, or through cut them once that you've got the thickest part of the bone. And we're going to identify, obviously, our medial orbital wall. As we said, that's the key um, to being sure that we know where we are. Um, make sure that we have that medial orbital wall identified. Once we've got that identified, really everything else becomes, uh, uh, becomes much more simple. So here we've got the, the, end, the medial orbital wall is now identified. And we're ready to go back through the basal lamella into the posterior ethmoid. And uh, as we said, the posterior ethmoid is a fairly narrow vertical height. And in my experience, that's one of the most common reasons that people go intracranially because they don't recognize that low skull base. Um, very important to look at that. Now we talked about opening up the sphenoid sinus and how to do it. And here we're just taking off the inferior portion of the superior turbinate. Um, I'm using a probe, uh, uh, usually use an image guidance probe now just to confirm the sphenoid osteum. Um, and then we'll just go ahead and widen that out. And I like to take it all the way up to skull base and all the way over to medial orbital wall. And that's what we're doing here. And then we'll come forwards towards the frontal sinus, working along the skull base, the same sort of routine in every case. Uh, we know once we've identified the skull base posteriorly, anything that comes down below that can just be taken. Uh, you don't have to worry too much about it, except we want to work again on the medial orbital wall because the skull base is a lot thicker laterally than it is medially. And we already talked about how it becomes membranous uh, over on the medial side. Now we'll go over to the maxillary sinus. I tend to do the maxillary sinus last, but that's just my personal preference. Um, and uh, here we're gonna take down some of those polyps. What I want to show here is taking that bone off the anterior part of the androstomy. See how it's thickened up, that unsnake process? And I just flicked it off by rotating the backbiting forceps medially. And it's very important to get that piece of bone off because it seems that the mucociliary clearance is most active from the anterior portion of the antrostomy. So um, we want to make sure that's widely open. So now you can see it's open. You can see the skull base from posterior to anterior and up into the area of the frontal recess. So what about opening the frontal recess? Well, you've got a lot of options today. Um, we could just do a balloon. I don't personally do balloons really very often at all. Um, but um, whether how much you open it really depends on what you can do postoperatively to some extent in the office and, and how familiar you are. For, for those that are not as familiar doing the frontal sinus, um, then the balloon is definitely an option, although it's an expensive option. Um, and the other thing to remember is that the draft three has a really proven a durable approach. Uh, to these cases. So here are different options. I don't think we do cranialization too much now. We don't, we rarely do frontal sinus with obliteration. We're much more likely to do an osteoplastic procedure if we have to do an open procedure, which we don't have to do that often, and combine it with a draft three. Um, uh, but those are our different options, and typically we'll do a draft two A. So again, coming back to image guidance, there's little evidence that it does reduce complications, but it does help. And one of the things that I really like is this malleable probe uh, that some of the companies now have. Um, uh, and I just wanna show that here because to me, this is so much better than a curved suction. Um, so here we have a curved suction, we can't get it up into the frontal recess. But this very fine, malleable probe, I can just bend into the area and it slides right up, as you can see on the CT scan there. Um, and then you can complete the frontal sinusotomy.
Um, time and time again, we see situations where the probe can confirm our frontal sinus drainage pathway, what we've already identified on the preoperative films. Um, and, uh, but the suction, uh, if we tried to push that in there, it would be pretty traumatic. Um, so um, I love this uh, very fine malleable probe. Um, again, uh, here's another one with the probe sliding easily up into the frontal recess, uh, as you can see on the image guidance pictures. Um, uh, but again, the, um, and you can use it too for identifying the sphenoid sinus, sliding it in there. Um, so these malleable probes, I think, have helped a lot. The other thing I think that's helped a lot is the 45-degree telescope. I'm a big believer of the 45-degree telescope. It has a wider angle of view than the 30-degree and the 70-degree telescope. And, um, and, and to me, it's a very easy scope to use. So the simple sinusotomy, the simple... Uh, original one, originally named by Heinz as, um, as uh, uh, uncapping the egg. And the reason for that is why the frontal sinus initially becomes obstructed often is you get an ethmoid cell which gets disease in it and it expands and then it blocks the frontal sinus drainage pathway. And somehow what we have to do is to remove that eggshell of the ethmoid from within the frontal recess. And that will reestablish the drainage pathway. And then in some situations, we may have to actually widen the osteum. So um, here are options available. Um, you know, uh, uh, for these, we still sometimes do external procedures, as I mentioned, but we're much more likely to combine it with a draft three if we have to do that. So let's just take a look at a more difficult frontal sinus case. This is a patient who has had a prior cranialization for trauma, and you can see that multi-loculated mucosal uh, within the frontal sinus. You saw all the loculations there. Um, so this is one which, um, if we didn't look at the films carefully enough before we did this, uh, we might think we've already drained this by just doing what we're doing right now, uh, just sucking out that mucus from within the ethmoid. Um, one of the rules dealing with these mucoseals is you got to take away all of that osteotic bone, and that's what you see us doing here. I'm trying to make sure I take all the osteotic bone. But this is actually only the beginning of this procedure because as we've said, this is multi-loculated. We identified this carefully preoperatively. Now we can go on to the second mucoseal and go ahead and gently open that up. Remember this patient's had a prior cranialization, so we know there's going to be um, some dura exposed posteriorly. Um, and here we are going on to a third mucoseal. Again, using that malleable probe um, that I've been able to bend as we move across the orbit. And uh, we're going to go ahead and open this one. And then there's still even one more after that. Just one comment on these um, uh, extensive mucoseals with a large area of bulk erosion. This one was not all eroded. But um, if you do that, you want to be careful how fast the brain actually decompresses. Uh, because um, uh, it, we have seen situations where patients have developed an intracranial bleed later, a day or two later, after this is uh, uh, the brain is decompressed. I, I personally haven't had one of those, but I, uh, some of our faculty have had. And so you just want to be a little bit careful. Obviously, if there's a whole lot of dura here, um, I would probably pack some gel foam in there just so that this thing slowly decompressed um, or some avatine or something similar um, so that it did not decompress too fast. And now we're going way across the orbit to the last mucoseal, um, which is way laterally. And again, um, I'm having to be careful here in terms of instrumentation, a little bit difficult to get that far lateral. 
uh, but you can see we're opening that one up and um, you don't want it to come back. We've got to get all that bony partition down, all that osteotic bone. Um, and then we can confirm that we're all the way over the orbit laterally uh, with, the, uh, with the image guidance. So, uh, so that's just an example of a difficult one. Now you can see I'm way over the far side with the image guidance there. So draft three, um, I think the, I don't want to say too much about that because I think everyone knows the key to draft three is if you have the two frontal sinuses here, you can't correct, connect them by a straight line. Why? Because the skull base comes out between the two of them anteriorly. And what you've got to do is to first drill anteriorly on both sides and then you can come across anteriorly and do a nice wide draft three. And it's gotten a lot faster now that we have 30,000 RPM um, curved burrs. And what's changed in it? What's changed is two, two things. One is we don't leave the bone exposed. Um, this is using either free mucosal grafts or mucosal flaps to make sure that we cover that bone anteriorly. And then what I typically do is I put in a propel stint uh, just to hold those mucosal grafts or mucosal flap in place um, at the end of the procedure and, and, and just releases a little bit of steroid to the area. Anyway, so with all of the surgery, the real key is to remember that the surgery is adjunctive to our medical care and, um, and that Opening up the sinuses does not resolve chronic inflammation. Um, the, I tell my patients with severe polyposis that the treatment really begins after the surgery, and it's trying to settle down that residual uh, inflammation. The thing that's been most important in our practice is to be able to do high-dose, high-volume steroid nasal irrigations, and this is actually correct incorrect. Uh, this is 0 0.5 to um, 2 milligrams of mimetazone or 0 0.6 milligrams of budesonide. I'm sorry that's reversed in the picture. But using high dose mimetazone um, has really made a big difference, steroid nasal irrigations postoperatively. And of course some of the other things we may have to consider uh, in the patients with severe disease. And again, remember, most of the cases I'm dealing with are revision cases. So this is what we do with our high-dose, high-volume steroid nasal irrigations. And it's been shown that you get good penetration and that the risks of this are very low, although it's not FDA approved. Um, uh, using it, about 3% of patients uh, on this alone get a little bit of HPAA suppression. Um, in one study, um, but that increases quite a bit if the patients are all also on inhaled steroids. No one, however, has been, uh, has been symptomatic from it. The key, of course, is, is making sure the patient complies with the medical therapy, um, and that can be sometimes, uh, sometimes difficult. We think the patients are going to do what we ask them to do. They don't. So um, if you have a, a myocardial infarction, the chances of you taking your medication on a regular basis, you'd think with a myocardial infarction, that's a pretty good warning shot across your bowel. Um, it's a pretty good idea. You've got a real problem. Um, but in actual fact, there's only about a 50% chance uh, you're going to actually take your medicines as prescribed, even if they're prescribed uh, without any cost to you. So if you have to pay for them, it goes lower than that. In one study in Quebec where um, prescriptions are heavily subsidized, 30% um, of prescriptions were actually never filled. And if you looked at the rhinologic subgroup of that, 40% of patients um, actually never filled their prescriptions. If you have cancer and you're on oral medications, 
the chances of you, now you'd think cancer, you're going to take your medications, right? But actually, uh, the chances are only about 50 to 60% that you will actually take the medicines as prescribed. So what way is there around that? One way is to put in a steroid eluding stint. And we do these in our polyposis patients, particularly uh, if there are likely to be issues with any oral steroids. And it just holds the turbinate over. So patients feel a lot better after the surgery. They're usually asymptomatic. But the fact that they're asymptomatic does not mean that the disease has resolved. And that's really key. Um, so these patients have persistent inflammation that will last for weeks, months, or even years before it slowly, slowly settles down. And during that time period, we have to continue to follow the patients endoscopically and treat them medically. And that's really important. Um, and the biggest mainstay is the steroid nasal irrigations, but then there are other things that we may want to consider as well. Um, certainly oral steroids in the early post-operative period, we don't want them to swell up and scar off, um, but topical steroids, um, and then some of the other things that we need to think about in terms of allergy management or aspirin desensitization, uh, which clearly has been successful um, uh, in a significant number of our patients with AERD. Um, and then in some situations, the monoclonal antibodies, of course, they're extremely expensive. In the US, dupilumab for a one year is about $50,000 um, without, without insurance. So um, you'd have to get it covered by insurance, obviously. Uh, but they are very expensive, but they are potentially an option for these difficult patients. So just to summarize, our goal shouldn't be just to improve the symptoms. It should be to get that mucosa to slowly, slowly settle down until it returns to normal. And then it remains stable or goes back to normal following a bad upper respiratory tract infection or a bad allergy. Um, and then as we see that happen, we can withdraw our medical treatment. Um, and the last one ever to be withdrawn is the topical steroids. And that we might, in many cases, just continue indefinitely. So all that's very well up until COVID. Now, what's changed now? And I think everyone's aware of this, that the viral counts are very high in the upper respiratory tract. Um, otolaryngologists and ophthalmologists are at particular risk uh, with COVID. Um, it's not just droplets, as we originally thought. The virus is aerosolized, and just speaking uh, puts it out into the atmosphere. Um, and any manipulation in the nose uh, clearly increases viral release. And the use of a drill um, as in our skull base cases, is particularly hazardous. So how are we dealing with that? And, and will it ever be the same again? So what do we do um, in, in our department now that we've opened up? So all the patients get questionnaires, um, uh, questionnaires about their, uh, their, their history. Uh, we take their temperature before they get into the waiting room. And we also do a pulse ox. And I want to just say a word about doing a pulse oximetry because we've seen patients who have had a lower oxygen tension, but no other symptoms of COVID. So having a pulse oximeter just to check someone's finger, I think is well worthwhile. And we do that before they go into our exam room, which now you can see the chairs are very well separated so that we have six foot separation. Um, everyone that comes in to contact with the patient has a mask. Uh, we obviously do very thorough instrument cleaning and sterilization. And then the question arises, should we actually be delaying the exam rooms between patients and we have very good air handling in our clinic. So we actually don't delay patients between rooms. We just leave about 10 minutes, um, uh, the room empty before the next patient goes in. But it is, I think, a, a very valid question as people 
start to open up their practices again. So our safety, I think, is, is still evolving. Um, uh, if you don't have an N95 mask on, you're not allowed in the room for more than 10 minutes. Um, if you have uh, all the physicians, we wear N95 masks, gown and gloves uh, with our patients. We don't spray the nose with local anesthetic anymore uh, or decongestant. We have to put in patties, um, neurosurgical patties into the nose with a local anesthetic. Um, and I use a little topical cocaine as well. Um, just worth recognizing, if you don't have N95 masks, then a consideration is the elastomeric mask. They're just as effective as the N95 masks. And in the US, they're very readily available. You look like Darth Vader with these things on, uh, but, they, uh, but they are also, um, uh, and, and so I always used to do direct endoscopy in the clinic. Um, but now everything has to be done off the monitor and we don't want to get that close to the patient. Um, what are we doing in the OR? Um, well, for general surgical cases, we will do our COVID testing up to 72 hours beforehand. But for the one, if the surgery is involving the airway, we do it the day before surgery, um, we do COVID testing. Um, everyone has N95 masks. Some people, some places are using PAPA. Um, that's generally not common um, uh, uh, in, in the US. Um, and I think we really don't quite know what the risks are at this point. But things are changing. So it's a, it, you know, there's an opportunity here for innovation and uh, people are picking up on that. Um, one is the concept of negative pressure screens in the OR. Uh, which, uh, which I think is very interesting. Uh, different types of masks, of vent masks, have been developed for the clinic, and those that will put in oxygen and, and just have a small port through which you can put in the, the scope. And they're starting to become available um, now uh, at this point in time. And I think the opportunity for the younger people here to think of this and try to think what might be good in future time is probably important. And I say that's important because although other things are getting better, um, a very well-known virologist uh, tells me that he does not believe the vaccines are going to be the answer in terms of providing permanent immunity. Um, he thinks that the immunity at best will probably be temporary from vaccines. And what we really need is improved antiviral medical therapy uh, so that we can avoid the patients having severe cytokine storms um, and, and then it becomes a much more manageable disease. Um, so um, according to him, he feels that what we're seeing now is probably going to be the new reality and it's probably not going to change uh, that much um, when we get vaccination. I don't know whether that's true or not, um, but he is concerned that the immunity will at best be temporary. And as you probably know, the current vaccines that are in trial have not been shown to reduce the risk of spreading the disease. They've only improved the issue for the actual patient. So looking forward to the future, I, I just want to say I look forward to the time that we're not anxious about the patient, where we can travel again, and um, when we can teach and come back and be present, and I can come back to beautiful Brazil. So um, I'm going to stop at this point and answer any questions um, that you may have. Sorry, everybody, sorry. Please go ahead, Anyway, you are very welcome to participate in the discussion since you know a little bit about the subject. <laughs> I have heard that you're doing the soft surgery too, so if, yeah, you, wish, yeah. you, if you wish, you are very welcome. Uh, I know you are very tired. Dave. Thank you so much for your memorable lecture in these horrible times that we are living. Uh, we are going to start with uh, Carlos Diogenes. You, if you want to make some comments and questions, please. Yeah, 
thank you very much for the opportunity to talk here today. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Kennedy, for the amazing presentation. Um, I learned a lot. One question I have is, uh, do you do any for like those patients with a really bad sinus infection, usually maxillary sinusitis, a wide mega antrostomy, like all the way to the floor? And do you have any experience with irrigation with antibiotics? Sometimes I, I, I discuss a lot of my cases with the, our infectious disease team, but they are really good. Sometimes I even, we even have patients that go IV antibiotics or irrigation with amicacin. So do you have any comment on that? So um, I do sometimes do some irrigation into the maxillary sinus. Um, and certainly, yes, megarantrostomy we do for the allergic fungal sinus cases. And, you know, for the patient with severe polyposis or um, cystic fibrosis, something like that will do a huge wide antrostomy. I don't do it routinely. Um, if the patient has minor maxillary sinus disease, I keep the antrostomy fairly small. Um, the other thing that we have looked at and is quite helpful, there is a balloon that you can put into the maxillary sinus um, and blow it up. And what it actually does, it's quite interesting. Um, so it's, it's quite cheap. This is not like the, the uh, osteo balloons, but you put it into the sinus. I didn't put any pictures into my presentation of this, but you put it in you blow it up and what it does is it squeezes the sinus walls and actually produces a whole lot more mucus that you couldn't see beforehand and, and compresses that mucosa back again. It probably takes out a few little cysts that are actually in the, in, in the mucous membrane. Um, and we've, we've used that a, a fair bit as well. Um, That's great, thank you. Um, Fabricio, your turn. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, Aldo and Shirley, for the invitation and the opportunity. Uh, thanks a lot, Dr. Kennedy, the uh, marvelous presentation, as usual. Uh, we've been watching your classes all around the world for a long time. They're always brilliant. I really like that. I have a lot of questions, but I, I'm really wanting to know, I think you, you're probably the, the person with more experience with this Mometason eluding stents. And we don't have them yet here uh, in Brazil, but I guess we probably have it sometime. Uh, my question is that uh, one of the, the reasons that people are using this uh, long, uh, high volume uh, irrigations with budesonide is to achieve that the, the corticoids uh, reach all the sinus. And my question is with the momentous and eluding stents that you put only in the ethmoids, do you get some results in the frontal and stenoid sinus, or through these bigger cases, you really need the high volume irrigation? So, you know, even if I put in the stent, I try to have the patients irrigate as well. And um, the, the ethmoid stent really just works on the ethmoid mucosa. They do have a contour stent. It's, it's sort of hourglass that goes into the frontal sinus. I actually don't like it because it has a fairly tight weave to that material. It's pretty tight and the mucosillary clearance doesn't come out through it well. So you actually have to put a suction up through it to get the mucus out in the post-operative period. It doesn't clean out as well as you would like. So I've tended not to use the contour stint, um, but the, the the irrigation, I think, has, has really turned things around. It's not so much the bedazonide now, but we use mimetazone a lot. And we go to compounding pharmacies, and they put one milligram or two milligrams into a little capsule, and uh, it's very cheap. Um, uh, it is, um, uh, for us, a very reasonable way of making sure that that mucosa settles down. Um, so, to me, I would say, if you ask me what's been the biggest change in my practice, it's the use of those irrigations um, in recent years, in the last 10 years, um, uh, has really enabled us to get the mucosa settled down more quickly without 
using oral steroids as much. Thank you. I would just let me take advantage of this question because uh, we have a similar question from the audience. Leonardo Balsalobri is asking you if, uh, about your experience in midomietos stents with uh, mometazone. Yeah, so I only use it in the polypoid patients, typically in revision polypoid patients. They're pretty expensive. So our hospital doesn't get reimbursed for them. If I use them, I have to sort of account for when I'm using them. And, you know, they, they are really at this point in time really too expensive, I think. Um, but I use them... Um, uh, I use them in the ethmoids and the recurrent polyp patients, particularly patients who are diabetic and I don't want to use a lot of oral steroids. I really want to minimize oral steroids or patients who psychologically don't do well on oral steroids. Then um, putting in the stint is a good way of getting steroid to the area um, and making sure it just holds that turbinate over, making sure the irrigation can get in and out. So um, in those situations, I use it. And as I say, on my draft threes, um, I usually put one right up into the frontal just to hold the mucosal flaps or mucosal grafts in, in place. Uh, still about the irrigations, we have some questions. Um, not just for you, I mean, if, if, uh, if, if the panelists want to, uh, to, to answer, that's okay too. Um, they are asking about the antibiotics uh, for irrigation, topical antibiotics. If you use, if you recommend. Um. <laughs> so I do use them. And I'll, my, so I, first I would say that the evidence for their use in chronic rhinosinusitis is not good at this point in time. So that's the evidence from the literature. So you're going to say, why do I use them? I use them because if you look at skin burns um, or skin ulcers and you do a DNA testing for bacteria and you treat using a topical <coughs> antibiotic based upon, um, based upon what you found on your 16S sequencing, then the wound healing is dramatically improved. That has been well demonstrated. So I do use them in the nose. Um, I use them maybe sometimes based on, on culture, but more often, I think, based on 16S sequencing and the difficult patients. And I believe that it helps. But I have to say the evidence for that is, in the literature is really not that good at this point in time. Mm -hmm. Aldo? Aldo, Aldo is there? <laughs> okay. Now he's out. <laughs> he's out for a coffee. <laughs> um, Carlos Diorgenes, do you usually uh, put antibiotics topics uh, for uh, irrigation? Yeah, um, usually I use the back band irrigation sometimes, especially in those patients that they're forming a lot of crusting, scabbing. Uh, I tend to do that. Uh, I discuss a lot, like I said, my cases with infectious disease. Sometimes I do amicacin irrigation uh, inside the sinuses as well. There's a, a nice device that ir irrigates now and suction, so it's kind of a constant flow and not like drawing the patient. So yeah, I, I, I do. I use in the past abramycin, other kind of antibiotics, but now I'm resuming more in amicacin and bactroban. Fabrizio. Like you said it's mostly like a feeling. It's like to do something else for the patients. Uh, but I noticed like my, I, I need to look at my data, but a lot of the patients, they, they improve when you do the amicacin irrigation. Oh, I do wow. daily. The patients, they come to the clinic every single day, weekdays, and then we do the irrigation. Great. How about you, Fabrizio? Uh, I do sometimes. Uh, when I see a little bit of the secretion and I don't want to use an oral antibiotic or maybe I, I use it with the oral antibiotics. I really think it works a lot. Uh, I have more uh, experience with gentamicin that we, we have more easily available here in Brazil. The only concern is that I dilute it a lot. Uh, I don't use it very concentrated because of the risk of uh, getting anosmia 
uh, on these patients. So I diluted it a lot, and I really think it has uh, very good results. How about you, Otavio? Uh, I, I would like to make a question based on, well, on your no, question you, to you, me. You will, you will. After, uh, after that, you will. Don't worry. Well, uh, usually I use more just steroids and uh, topical steroids, uh, uh, budesonide, and once in a while, the way I look, the surgery, the after surgery is going on, and I see too many cross, and I have to see the patient more than once a week, then I, I also uh, use some mucuricin. Uh, so they wash the nose four times a day, and as Dr. Kennedy said, they don't want to wash two times a day. So we hope to believe that they are using four times a day. So I mean, I, I usually I use I use sometimes, but not regularly. Okay, you can ask your question now. So well, please let uh, Dr. Kennedy comment. say something. So we do have one other option in the states, um, other than the steroid nasal irrigations, and that is this thing called the Optinose device. You've probably heard it. It's the EDS, the exhalation delivery system for putting in topical steroids. Um, you'll see it quite a bit. It was developed by uh, Per Dupersland in Norway. And he actually um, uh, demonstrated that you get really great particle deposition with this device. It was bought or developed by a company in the US. And um, what happened in the US is the company has put a very high price on this device. Um, but it actually gets into the sinuses very well. It's just a very bad business model. Um, so we do use this um, uh, and it actually gets into the frontal sinus better than the irrigation valves. So um, we, we quite like it for the, for the frontal sinus. Um, I think it's better than irrigation for the frontal but it's, it's, it's quite expensive, the device, and that's a huge issue. It's not a good business model. They get insurance reimbursement for it and shouldn't have a big copay, but um, it is a bit of an issue. Thank you. Go for your question, Otavio. So first of all, I'd like to say thanks for Shirley and for Aldo for inviting me. It's really a honor, Dr. Kennedy, to be among the other guys here that are listening and making questions for you. Uh, this whole lecture was about the history of endoscopic uh, sinus surgery and chronic rhinosinusitis in the last decades. And uh, being part of uh, a panel where our, uh, our teacher, our teacher has been being part of this history for the last 35 years. And that's not a lot, but I mean, you are, you are sinus surgery for us. You are endoscopic sinus surgery. And, and it's really an honor, Dr. Kennedy. I was uh, in more than one course being a student and being today here, being able to make a question is really a very important moment for all of us. Uh, well, saying that, I would like to ask you one, I don't know if that's a hard question, but a few days ago, we had the uh, EPOS. The, the 22, uh, 22, no, 2020 EPOS. And we just have uh, tons of, of uh, literature put it together. And whenever we open a new panel, everyone that comes say, how do you do it? So uh, do you believe we are gonna get a day in sinus surgery and, and, and treatment of chronic rhinosinusitis where we are gonna be able not to have so many differences among different people? Yeah, it's a good question. So the problem is it's really not one disease. You know, it's this broad spectrum. spectrum. And it's quite possible that my possibility is not what I'm treating. So, you know, um, that, that's the problem about it. It is, um, uh, it is the fact that, that, that we're not dealing with one, one particular disease entity. There's no doubt in some diseases, or some entities, the minimal surgical procedure seems to work very well. 
those are not the patients that I see. The patients that I see, we need to open everything up and, and really make sure that we end up with a very clean but mucosally lined cavity um, it, to the extent that that's possible. So um, do I think that techniques will become more standardized? I hope so. I wish I, wish I was more confident, but I, I really hope so. Um, I hope that we can narrow that spectrum down over time and classify the disease better and, and know what we need to do for each disease. Luciano, do, do you have a different opinion about uh, what was said already uh, uh, regarding the antibiotics and, and sinus? No. Or uh, 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 hi, 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 everyone. I would like first to thank uh, Auto and Shirley Pignatari for the invite and like to highlight Leonardo Summer Performance that gathered um, 200,000 uh, American dollars out of donations to Hospital Sao Paulo. It was amazing uh, live performance. So I don't do it uh, to start, I don't do it uh, differently. I agree with Fabrizio Romano. Sometimes I use antibiotics uh, on irrigations, but uh, I, dilute it, I, I dilute a lot. And um, I use when people, a patient got a lot of crossing, uh, mainly in the post-op. Or if I culture, uh, in the end, I try to make uh, topical irrigations before going to like uh, oral antibiotics. Professor, I have a, a question. Can I ask for, for Professor Kennedy? Sure. So uh, what kind of routine did you change from the uh, pre-COVID era to now? So the patient got in your office, he do like a, it's not 22 or not in the iPad. And then he goes to your office and then you coach her or do you not coach her? Do you like do samples for endotyping or phenotyping? What do you do back there that you do, do not do now? Uh, and what do you think it's like ideally for patients with CRS? So since we've opened up in the COVID era and opened up to patients again, uh, patient volume is much reduced. Um, we, uh, we can only see a more limited number of patients because of the necessity of really cleaning the rooms between every patient. Um, we still have a situation where, as I mentioned, <coughs> the nurses can come into the room for up to 10 minutes. We don't have N95 masks for the nurses. It's only for the physicians. So they can only spend 10 minutes in the room. Um, and then what happens is I go in with the patient that used to be myself and a resident. Now the residents are not allowed into the room. So it's me um, that goes into the room and I have to finish off the, uh, uh, the history um, and do the full examination myself, which I, you know, I didn't necessarily do everything myself from beginning to end before. Um, so it has slowed us down quite a bit. Some of us are, because the nurses can't be in the room to enter the data into the electronic medical record, uh, some of us are leaving the phone open. In other words, putting a phone open so that the nurse outside the room can actually record what we're saying, um, what we think the issues are, um, and, and, and start to, to put the data into the electronic medical record but then I have to finish off afterwards. Um, what else, you know, as I said, I no longer look through the endoscope in the clinic. I used to look through the endoscope. I don't want to get that close to the patient. Um, I always work off the monitor now. Um, uh, we're not spraying the patients. Um, we just put in the applicators and um, we are obviously a bit more anxious about it um, than, uh, than we used to be. Um, so in another year, I'll let you know how it went. Um, you know, I want to actually go and get my antibody testing done at some point because uh, I did have a, an unusual upper respiratory tract infection back in March, um, which did not have the typical COVID signs. Uh, but which I now, in retrospect, believe might have been a COVID. Um, and so, um, you know, it, but it, it, it has slowed us down a lot um, in terms of the volume of patients that we would see. 
And until we can get N95 masks, we don't have N95 masks for the residents in the clinic yet. They have to be in the operating room, but not in the clinic. And so once they have those in the clinic, then I think um, uh, they will be able to come back in and participate in the physical exam as well. Uh, Pedro Sintra is asking you if you screen your patients with any kind of um, diagnosed uh, uh, test before the operation for yes. COVID? Before FEST, they have to have COVID testing one day beforehand. So they have to, if it was a general surgical procedure or any other surgical procedure, they could have the COVID testing done up to three days beforehand. But for the upper airway, we want to get the COVID testing done ideally within 24 hours prior to the actual surgery. We do not do it for the clinic. Um, all we do in the clinic is the temperature questionnaire and pulse oximetry. Um, and, and as I say, I think the, the one that to me has been the most interesting really is probably the pulse oximetry because we have seen patients who come in feeling fine and yet their oxygen levels are significantly reduced. And then we do COVID testing on them and the COVID is, testing is positive. We send them for COVID testing. Um, so if there's a simple, easy, relatively inexpensive device to put in the clinic, I would say get a pulse oximeter um, as well as probably taking the temperature, but a pulse oximeter just to check the patient um, is uh, is certainly worthwhile. But no, we don't do uh, we don't do actual COVID testing just before we do nasal endoscopy. We just do the nasal endoscopy without that, mm -hmm. and even debridement we will do without that. Well, I'm going to change the subject because Wilma, you know Wilma, the former president of the Brazilian, she's driving me crazy. She sent. <laughs> 30 times the same question. So I have to ask you that. I don't, I don't even know what it's about. It's about a technique called the reboot. Uh, I've never heard about. It's preconized by, for, um, by Klaus Barre. Mm -hmm. And they want to know your opinion about this reboot technique. <laughs> when you Easy. recommend. Easy. Don't <laughs> do it. Don't do it. So let me explain. So when we started out doing FEST, we didn't worry if we stripped a bit of mucosa from the ethmoid. It, it was, you know, as I said, we did it under local anesthesia. We did it pretty quickly. We didn't have through cutting forceps. We used Blakely, Blakesley forceps. We tried to preserve mucosa, but if we stripped a bit, we stripped it. It wasn't a big deal. Um, and sometimes we would strip more than a bit. I can tell you those patients did not do well um, where we stripped mucosa. Um, the stripping mucosa in the presence of inflammation is not a good idea. And why is it not a good idea? So we found that they didn't heal well. They got scarring. They got mucoseals. They got more bony osteitis. That bone would thicken up. And then occasionally we would see patients that developed chronic pain syndrome as a result. And we think it was associated with the inflammation in the bone. Remember, um, when you do cold well luck, if you look at the statistics and strip the mucosa, about 30% of those patients get some chronic, uh, chronic discomfort in the area. And I think that's from stripping. I don't think it happens with tumors, but it does happen with inflammation. It used to be 30% got some chronic discomfort. And I think that's from stripping mucosa in the presence of inflammation. So um, I think Klaus is absolutely wrong on this. Um, I would not recommend rebooting or trying to reboot them because the other thing is, you know, if we failed early on, if we failed in maxillary sinus disease, when we were starting to do FAS, we would go back and we would do a cold well lock and we would strip out all the mucosa. Um, those patients 
did not do well. It did not resolve the issue. So um, I think you need to preserve the mucosa on the skull basin on the medial orbit. Yes, we want to get all of those bony partitions out of there very meticulously and make sure we don't leave any cells behind, but I, I definitely don't advise stripping the mucosa. And I don't think there's anyone in the US that's doing that to my knowledge um, in terms of, of Klaus's reboot procedure. Uh, that is uh, another question here about the omalizumab. Um, if you have experience, uh, if the, the other uh, panelists, if you do, Shirley, I missed what you said. Experience. Uh, I don't know how to say this correctly. Omalizumab. Oh, omalizumab. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. So, um, omalizumab is um, is only indicated in the U.S. for patients who have asthma at this point in time. It does not have an indication for nasal polyps. That said, patients who are on it for um, uh, for their asthma uh, often get better from the nasal polyposis standpoint. Currently, to my knowledge, the only drug that's approved for nasal polyposis, the only monoclonal antibody, um, is dupilumab. And our experience with dupilumab is that about 70% of patients appear to respond to it when we have to use it. And of course, we only use it in the very severe recurrent polyposis patients that have had multiple prior surgeries. And we can tell they're going to be steroid dependent, oral steroid dependent, if we don't put them on this. Um, so with those patients, um, we've found that about 70% of patients respond to it pretty nicely. Um, but about 30% of patients do not respond to dupilumab. And each of those monoclonal antibodies that I showed are currently in trials looking for approval for nasal polyposis. So omalizumab is looking for approval, FDA approval, um, just for the indication of nasal polyps. And the other ones, uh, resmal resmalizumab, um, and the... Uh, <laughs> They're all looking for the same approval as well. So uh, the clinical trials are ongoing, but they're not there yet. But yes, I do think that in all of them, in some patients, can create a significant improvement. Thank you. Um, José Lubianca from Rio Grande do Sul. Uh, he wants to ask you if you believe that the, a children can really have a, rhino, a chronic rhinosinusitis uh, without any other comorbidities? And if you believe that the can be the source of bacteria for the, the, the sinus? So I think the evidence suggests that in children, a good first measure is doing the adenoidectomy um, uh, rather than doing something to the sinuses. That said, I don't want to say too much about children because we have such a big pediatric otolaryngology group that I basically never see any kids anymore. So, um, but yeah, our, our, our experience early on was that it did not tend to be as uh, as severe in kids in general, we didn't have to do as much. We could do a much more limited surgical procedure. Um, uh, I, I'm going to stop at that point because I'm really not seeing the kids anymore. Um, can I can I make a question, uh, Shirley? Sure, Otavio. Sure. Sure, Dr. Kennedy. Uh, we all agree that we we treat our patients to make them feel better. Uh, sometimes we don't have beautiful cavities and they feel better and that's good. But my question to you is, among your patients where you do a very good entrostomy, a large entrostomy, a, a very good etmoidectomy, a very large opening on the sphenoid, and you follow them and they have beautiful cavities, but the frontal recess has polyps with a 2A surgery. And, and I believe that most of us try to do a 2A surgery at first hand. Uh, 
I know that you don't see most often uh, virgin patients, patients who are already uh, submitted to surgery, but if we do so these big opens and they do so well with uh, washing with steroids, why don't we go straight ahead for a big opening of the frontal sinus with a draft tree among the other openings? Isn't that rational? I mean, if my goal is to have them being washed, why don't I do for at first hand for a tree at the frontal? So, you know, I don't do a draft tree as a first procedure. Um, I think few people in the U.S. are doing that. I know P.J. Wormald does that in the in the um, AARD patients. I would say we rarely do a draft tree as a as a first procedure. That said, um, we have been pleased with the way that topical steroids seem to get up in there when we do a draft three. Um, uh, whether it be with irrigation or whether it be with that device that I talked about, the OptiNose EDS okay. device, um, it seems to get the steroid in there very nicely. And we have seen, I mean, I would say the draft three procedure in our experience has done well long term. Those patients have done well long term, and we have been able to minimize or eliminate um, any systemic steroid use. So, um, uh, so I, I, you know, that's, that's what I would say. We 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 use it, but we don't use it initially. And if I see a patient with bad polyposis um, and it's diffuse. I won't go straight to a draft three. I'll, I'll do the ethmoid and, and do a draft two B or draft two A first, and, and then see what happens. And um, uh, and you know most of them will settle down. If they don't, then I'll talk to them about. Hey, listen, I think we need to go back and do it. There. That's what we do. Uh, we are uh, almost uh, running out of time, so. I'm going to ask the panelists if they have any other questions. Very straight question, please. Okay, Luciano, go ahead. Thank you, Professor. So, Dr. Kennedy, do you think that the surgeon era is about to end? So, I saw a lecture from Falkins on uh, the, the last European uh, Congress. She said that the immunobiologicals are going to change our practice. What do you think about that? I think it's wrong. <laughs> so let me tell you why I think that's wrong. Because firstly, the cost of the monoclonal antibodies is outrageous. We actually just had a panel at NIH, which was allergists and otolaryngologists, talking about the role and what needs to be done in terms of studies of the monoclonal antibodies. And all of the allergists there felt that monoclonal antibodies should be reserved essentially for patients who have failed prior surgery or where surgery is contraindicated. Now, that said, I did have one patient who was a 27-year-old single female who wanted to go on and have kids and get married. Um, who I was had had a balloon procedure done and had polyps. And naturally, I was going to revise it and said the patient needs a decent surgery. Um, but the patient saw an allergist in New York who convinced the patient that maybe they should have a monoclonal antibody instead. And I had to have a long family discussion um, before I convinced the patient and the family that they really should go ahead with surgery and routine medical therapy and not go ahead with a monoclonal antibody. Again, $50,000 a year starting at age 27. I mean, that's outrageous. Um, the possibility that we don't know what the long-term side effects are of the monoclonal antibodies, um, what the potential risks are, uh, particularly in the COVID era, maybe it's higher, um, what the potential cancer risks are, which, you know, um, with the original am amelizumab, uh, there was one case of uh, leukemia, which didn't occur in the study, 
that it occurred, or was it lymphoma? I think it was lymphoma, occurred after the study ended, but the question was, was it related? Um, you know, so I think you, the general feeling in the US is they definitely should be saved for patients who have failed standard medical therapy, uh, standard surgery and medical therapy. I, uh, that's, um, that's really the way it is. Or they have such bad asthma that they would be on oral steroids. So um, uh, we use it very restrictively, um, recognizing that the costs are outrageous and there's so much unknown about what the long-term side effects may be. Um, but it is helpful in, a, in certain patients. Fabrizio, last question. Uh, Professor Kennedy, uh, there's, there's been a lot of uh, attempts to try to characterize better our chronic rhinosinusitis patients. And one of the things that we've been hearing a lot is about central compartment atopic disease. I would like to know your thoughts about that, if you believe in that, and if you manage these patients differently from the the normal eosinophilic CRS patients? Yeah, so I think there is evidence that patients with allergies are more likely to have centripetal disease or, um, uh, or central compartment disease. I, I absolutely believe that. Um, whereas where the inflammatory component is greater, then it tends to be more on the periphery uh, and as a result of the blocked sinuses. Um, so, but do I treat them differently? No, not really, because I want most of my patients with eosinophilic disease to have an allergy evaluation, um, even if it's only to understand what they should avoid environmentally. Um, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that they have to have desensitization, but most of my patients, pretty much all of my patients with eosinophilic disease, I insist that they have allergy evaluation. As I said at the beginning, you know, if, if you don't do that and you open up the sinuses, then the whole inflammatory process can start again at a deeper level as a result of the environmental factors. And, and that's what we really want to try to avoid. Well, this is, was really a very memorable <laughs> lecture. Thank you so much for all of you. Um, before I leave you, I'm going to ask uh, Aldo for oh. your turn, Aldo. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, 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 let me see here. Thank you very much, David, for a wonderful lecture, as usual. Uh, I am very happy. You mentioned many times that the surgery is not the only treatment for chronic rhinosinusitis. I agree 100%. Regarding the question of Dr. Pilcher, or Dr. Pilcher, I think it's a very important question regarding the frontal recess and frontal sinus. The question is why the frontal recess and frontal sinus is the most common residual disease of the chronic rhinosinusitis. The, the, the answer is, this is the most difficult part to operate. Okay. And we talk about the frontal recess. Frontal recess is not the frontal sinus. Frontal recess is the anterior timoid cells. You need the special instruments, very skilled surgeon, etc., etc., etc. So the question is: the first fail is because of the incomplete surgery. Second, remove the mucosa and periosteum of the frontal recess. And third, Sometimes you can put the, the topical therapy inside the frontal sinus. The question about Dave, about the um, IP diameter, very narrow, very narrow IP diameter. You have it inside the frontal sinus, chronic disease. You can enter through the nose adequately using drop 2A or 2B. So in this particular situation, very particular situation, I think in this particular situation, many people contraindicate drop three, but I think this is a special for drop three. If you have a good IP diameter, you can enter into the frontal sinus using a drop to A, or even to B, but I prefer to A. So in this particular situation, very narrow space, very narrow space, you can enter inside, you can remove the disease, you can deliver the medicine inside. In this particular situation, I think a drop three is indicated. It's much more difficult. It's more, more difficult to operate. 
because you need to deal in with a very narrow space. The chance for CSF or lesion some uh, around the structures is, 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 is occurring. So this is just, just a comment maybe about, about this area. This, I try to explain why uh, this particular region, uh, you can see much more recurrency or much more residual disease than other parts. Uh, I don't know if you have some comments about this. No, I think you're absolutely right, Aldo. I think, um, I think it's a, the draft three is a very good operation in the selected patients yeah. where you really want to, where it's really persistent frontal recess disease. If the patient has diffuse polyploid disease, then I think we need to look at other medical therapies and say, let's, what can we do to get that under control? Yeah. And it, it may be, it may be aspirin desensitization, it might be a biologic, it might just be something environmental. Um, but for, for persistent frontal recess disease, uh, where, where everything else has been opened, I think the draft three really works very nicely. Yeah, I, I, I still have some, some concept in my mind. The chronic rhinosinusitis is the only most difficult disease to treat. I prefer to operate a tumor. If you remove a benign tumor, you can cure the patient. But to treat the chronic rhinus sinusitis is very difficult. It's very unpredictable. This is the problem. Well, uh, I think uh, our time is gone. Uh, I'd like to thank you very much for all the participants uh, from different countries for this wonderful lecture. Uh, Shirley, the moderator, our panelists, uh, great questions, uh, great comments. Uh, thank you again, Kennedy, for accepting our invitation and spend your time with us. Uh, I must confess you, each time I, I listen to you, I learn more and more and more. So your concepts about chronic grand sinusitis were absolutely amazing, absolutely fantastic. Uh, if you allow me, then let me introduce uh, the, 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 our next uh, lecture, next, next Thursday, with Peter Batista from Spain. And he will speak about the new insights in surgical management of obstructive sleep apnea. This is a very important topic. I'd like to invite all of you uh, next Thursday, 6 p.m. Uh, many thanks to Camila, uh, Dasi, our coordinator. And thanks, Shirley, again, and all the people for participating. And hope to see you very soon. Uh, I don't know when, but I hope to see you <laughs> very soon. Thank you very much, David. My best regards to you and your family. Thank you, Carlos, Fabricio, Luciano, uh, uh, and Otavio, and Sheeran, and all the participants of this uh, meeting. I really appreciate, and of course, I learn a lot. Thank you. Thanks, Aldo. Stay healthy down there. All right. I hope this COVID settles down very nicely for you as well. Take Thank care. Thank you. Thank, Thanks thank you so much. Thank you so much. Look forward to seeing you all again. Take care. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Obrigado, Camila. Imagina, gente. Tchau, tchau. Obrigada a você. Tchau, tchau. Obrigado, Camila. Tchau, tchau. Parabéns Obrigado, pelo, Aldo. Pela, pelo manejo aí. Valeu a força, Camila. Tchau, tchau. Beijo, tchau.